Hello, David K. U Star TV. We're with Matt, Dr. Fink of Prince and the Revolution at his recording studio, Starview Recording Studios. Hey, Matt, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, man. Good to see you. Nice Thanks. digs here. Uh, how you been? Good. You been busy? The Purple Experience, your Prince Tribute band's been playing a lot? Yes, we've been very busy this year. That's good. Now, the other band you were in, Prince and the Revolution, was a good band. Yes. I particularly like the keyboard playing in that band. Thank you. There was another guy in that band, what was his name, that Prince Rogers Nelson guy? How'd you come across him? Uh, well, I worked with uh, Bobby Z back then a little bit, and he came to me, uh, the drummer. Mm -hmm. He hadn't even officially, uh, well, I think he, he wasn't quite in the band yet when I first talked to Bobby about Prince. Uh, Bobby played me his demo tape that his older brother, David Rifkin, had uh, recorded for the record labels to hear so uh, Bobby played it for me and I said oh this this guy's really great uh, who's the band <laughs> and he goes well it's not a band it's uh, one person performing all the instruments and singing on it and I said that's interesting that's not that, that you don't see that every day so about a year later or so uh, I had the opportunity to uh, audition for the group at that point, and that's when Prince decided to hire me. So then how long did you play before they started actually calling it Prince of the Revolution? Because there were some years before, right? Yeah, we did a, you know, a few tours uh, with a few of the early albums uh, up until the end of the 1999 album was when the Prince of the Revolution name came into being. When did he mention, hey, you guys were going to be, I got this movie thing I'm working on, or did it just... Well, he, he revealed to me right at the end of the 1999 album tour, and this was uh, long about, uh, you know, May or June of 1982. He took me aside for a little just one-on-one -on -one meeting to let me know that his plans to do a movie were in the works, and was I down for that? And you had some of those songs on that record. Did you have some writing credits? I I had a uh, some writing credit on the song "Computer Blue" on that album. So, what are the anecdotes that'd be fun to share about the Purple Rain movie? Well, that the you know Revolution. When you think about the dressing room scene in the yeah. movie, there's like one really. Big That's scene your big with, line, right? That's, well, I had I had my a big one line in the movie. It was kind of like a comedic <laughs> line, and but that scene in the dressing room early on in the film took place in a on a set. It was it was not really the First Avenue, though. It's not as laid out. It's a whole different layout, size wise, and everything. And I re I remember the set itself was much bigger than. The real thing, um, trying to film in the real dressing room would have been, would have been difficult. Yeah. So I wasn't always privy to what was. I was on call. You know, you're just there all day. You show waiting, up. At, waiting, waiting. You show up at 6 a.m. Get your hair and makeup done, and then you sit around all day waiting for them to say, "Okay, we're ready for you." The way your makeup looks great today. Thanks. <laughs> camera angles, yeah, that's a lot of sweat going on there. Camera angles, where you know have to get set up, and then they, they it's a very tedious. Uh, as most people know, filming yeah. is a tedious process. Yeah. There was stuff actually at First Avenue on the stage itself. Those were yeah. live performance uh, sequences, um, not where we were playing live. Of course, yeah. we're lip syncing into the soundtrack yeah. music, but they were still portrayed as live. Yeah. And, Sounded very live. Looked really they good sound and looked great because the songs were recorded live in the studio in a big warehouse. Actually, they weren't, yeah. we weren't in really a big studio. We had a, a a building in St. Louis Park where I grew up. Actually, I grew up in that suburb of Minneapolis, and Prince just coincidentally, his people rented a building right on Highway Seven, not far from where I went to high school. Really close. I mean, just a hop, skip. Like I could walk so over that there. So must have been surreal for you. It was kind of surreal, but uh, again, we spent the summer of 1983 prepping for the movie. Yeah. Uh, seriously, like June, July, and August. It was prepping. all three months prepping, getting ready to film, yeah. because we had, a recording the songs, writing them, 
uh, arranging them, B, um, working with acting coach and dance instructors. We recorded uh, some of the soundtrack at a live concert at First Avenue, and this was August 3rd of 1983, and it was for the, a benefit performance for the Minnesota Dance Theater where we were doing the dance lessons in that building. And they had a, a choreographer brought in and they just were renting the space with a yeah. separate guy that really didn't work there. But there, were, there was an, a dance guy named John Command who was a teacher and dancer, great guy. And he came in and uh, a lot of fun working with him. And then we did, and then Prince decided to do a benefit to raise money for them. And, and then those songs that were we played that night were recorded live and, and most of it made the, the movie. Wow. So when you hear Purple Rain... It's not from the record, it's from that. When you hear, from, yeah, when you hear Purple Rain, the song itself, it was recorded that night at First Avenue and then edited down, you know, they, they changed it a little yeah. bit from... It had an extra verse that got edited out and then they added live strings to it in, the, in another studio, but, but that main performance was all there. And same for some of the other songs. Yeah. But about half the album was done in the studio, the other half was live at that yeah. show. So that was a very interesting part of that. How did the doctor then come about? Did Prince just decide, okay, you're gonna wear a doctor outfit? <laughs> no, no, Prince did not totally decide it, but uh, it was more of like, uh, it's an interesting story. I've told it many times in other places, books, whatever you some people may already know this story, but our first real tour where we were an opening support act for for a more popular artist which was rick james that year this was this is you're talking about late very late 79 wow. it's our first opportunity to open for someone like him and we're about three shows into the tour and i'm wearing a black and white striped jailer suit or i mean prisoner suit right which i also wore on American Bandstand on our very first TV performance just not too long before this tour started. So I'm in the jail suit. I picked this out because I thought black and white stripes look great with black and white keyboards. Classic kind of rock themes and stuff like that. Prince liked that idea so we went with that. In the meantime Rick James uh, comes out wearing a jail suit on one of his songs called the songs called Bustin' Out of L7 was meaning the cell block L7. Yeah. So he's wearing a, a really like very thick black and white striped outfit. And then halfway through the song, of course, he, he tears the top off. It's like Velcro in the front and you know, he does this, you know, throws it off. And uh, Prince comes to me after about the third show. And he says, you know, I've been thinking the headline act is wearing a jail suit on that song and you're in the jail and you're in the jailbird suit i think you should change your look unfortunately and i go yeah but rick's only wearing it on one song so what you know he goes yeah but you both have the same outfit at some point it's you're gonna have to change your look and i go darn <laughs> i really like <laughs> that really one shoot you know i'm saying to prince oh come on but he, he's not listening. So he goes, what were your other choices before you came up with the jail suit outfit? And I said, well, Batman. Um, yeah, Batman, <laughs> Superman. Uh, no. Uh, and actually, I, I started kind of throwing some other looks out at him that I that I actually tried earlier that he had re we used a couple in videos actually. I said my one of the other ideas I had that I was considering was a guy in a in a doctor's scrub suit to have a doctor character and and then his the light bulb went bing over his head and he said, "Aha. Okay. I think let's try that." And I went, "Okay." So then our wardrobe gal who was on tour with us because back then we had a, we actually had a wardrobe. There was enough support from the record label to actually had, you know have, have a wardrobe person with us on tour. So uh, she ran out to a uniform store in Chicago. This is in Chicago, and they went out and bought full re authentic doctor scrubs, stethoscope, surgeon masks, cap, 
the whole shebang. Did you wear the cap? I had the cap in the beginning, yeah. I had the cap on and all that stuff. And it kind of looked like you a little bit. A little bit as like if this. the cap is on. Yeah. So, uh, and then sunglasses. So then Prince says to me, uh, I want you to come out wearing the mask over your face and sunglasses. I was already wearing sunglasses with the jail suit. He goes, I want you to wear the mask so people can't see your face. And I went, no. Did you take that person like, yeah, I did. You don't I did. like this? I did take it personally at first. I was like, well, I don't want people to not see me. And it's bad <laughs> enough I'm wearing a cap now and sunglasses and all that. They can't even see my eyes. And he goes, it'll be great. You'll see. It'll be mystery, dude. You know, it'll be great. You'll they'll love it. And I was like, ah, okay. So I did that. As much as I wasn't wild about it. You hear that, Prince? <laughs> I wasn't officially wild about that. Okay, so... Prince is a very big fan of my show. He's a big fan of my show, too. <laughs> so anyway, um, I... So the... When I had the mask on, of course, it kind of fit under here a little bit. So I get on stage and I'm wearing the mask the first time and I'm breathing and the steam is coming up through the mask into the glasses, <laughs> steaming up everything. Can't see what I'm doing on stage. Hitting bad notes? No. So fortunately, no, but it, it was annoying. Yeah. It was hard. Uh, um, and then after the show, I said to Prince, I said, I'm getting steam in my glasses. I can't see what's going on. He goes, well, okay, you can take the mask off after the first song or two. So I got to put up with that for the first two songs. He goes, yeah. And I go, okay. So then he goes, after a couple of shows, he says, now I've decided to incorporate a, uh, another thing when I, in the show that when I introduce you, I'm going to have a painter's easel up there behind you. And I want you to act like you're painting something when I introduce you on stage. And then I looked at him and I said, seriously? <laughs> You want me, a doctor, the doctor character, to be acting like I'm painting a, on stage? He goes, yeah, just pick up the brush and start painting, man. You know, pretend you're painting. And I go, well, I need some watercolors up there. I need some kind of oil paint or something. If I'm going to be painting, it'll look like I'm not really painting or drawing. He goes, don't worry about it. It'll be so quick. They'll have the spotlight on you. You'll act like you're painting, and that'll be it. And I go, okay, they're going to, you know, the audience is going to be a little confused about me up there pantomiming painting as a doctor I don't know was he doing this to the other band members it was just you just painted, me they just trying to make me look like a complete <laughs> idiot I don't know that was his guy. goal yeah I guess I think that's what it was so <laughs> so that he tried that for about three shows to see what would happen and it didn't fly <laughs> the other band was going as well as I what? yeah great as what I about me as can I, I do something stupid hey, yeah what do I get to do <laughs> but as I predicted it didn't fly very well so then um, I had a camera with me. So then I decided to take pictures of the audience. So as soon as he's introduced me, I'd get the camera up and go up and I have pictures of that whole tour of the audience. And then he loved that idea because they would, audience would go nuts, they'd clap and point at me and, and then they'd take pictures back. It was all, it was great, you know. So that turned out to be a good idea. And thanks for trying Prince, I appreciate. <laughs> the effort on the, the easel, painting easel thing, we, uh, you know. He is a creative genius. He is creative. That that one was one of the rare moments of, of oh, maybe not something. Maybe not so much. Wasn't the, <laughs> the best thing to have a, the painting doctor. But anyway. It's 8 o'clock on a Monday morning, and I am here in one of the busiest and craziest places of Port Elizabeth, South Africa. You see drugs, prostitution, child trafficking, life and death. 
This is Sinatimba. It is a home to 26 children. There's 17 boys and there's nine girls. But most of them have been neglected. They've been abused. They've been abandoned. But right here at Sinatimba, they find a safe haven. Mama Signoria, with the help of her husband and volunteers, provide a stable home environment for the children growing up and looks after them up until the age of 20. Mama, tell us, what motivated you? What, what inspired you to, to do this? The thing that motivated me a lot at the age of six up to 17, I spent the whole 10 years as a street child in the street. My mother was an alcoholic woman. She has no condition to raise me up. And I didn't know my father was. I didn't want to see each and every, even one child, to taste the, the life that I tasted before. That's why I gave my life to them. What I like in most in Sinatamba, I like Mama because Mama helped me. I was so young and my mother left me in, in the house. Teach us the right things and not to speak wrong to other guys and not to play with bad guys at school. Mama encourages working together as a team. Each child has daily tasks which build strong personal relationships amongst the children and it solidifies the feeling of a family unit. Mama gave me a big help and I, I, I appreciated what she did to me. So now I take uh, Mama as my family, I take her as my mother and my father. What I want for them, to give them education to be the better, citizen of the South Africa for education, to give them life, to give them hope. When I grow up, I want to be a social worker. I want to be a nurse. I want to be an artist and design clothes. Mama has inspired and given these children hope for a bright future. The home relies heavily on funding and donations to feed, to clothe, and look after these children. This is becoming increasingly difficult with the lack of support. The question I ask myself is what will happen to these children if they're unable to keep the center running? If I was in the incident, I think I would be in the streets. The lives and future of 26 children could drastically change. Without Sinathemba, these children would not be able to afford an education, a home, or even a meal. It will take the volunteers, the local community, and the community abroad to keep this project going. A small gesture can bring about a monumental change in a child's life. You're my sword, you're my shield, you're my friend running down my foe in a dangerous field, and I thank of you, I pray for you wherever you go, I just wanted to let you know. You're my son, you're my daughter, you're my sister, you're my brother You're my father, you're my mother, you're my warrior, father I went on to do the Sign of the Times tour, Love Sexy tour, and what was called the Nude tour, which basically supported the Batman soundtrack album yeah. of, of 1989. So I was there for all that. And I probably could have, you know, kept going longer with him uh, at, at, by the end of 1990. But what happened is, is I, I got involved producing an album at that time. And I just signed this contract to do somebody's record. And Prince, on short, very short notice, came to me and said, Hey, we've been offered to play at Rock and Rio in South America. I need you to report to rehearsal like ASAP. So I, I went back to Prince. And, I told him that I really wanted to do that project, and so he got a sub for me, somebody else. And the, and then after that, he, he just kind of... Got the sub? 
But that's how it goes. That's what happens. That is. That is. That's just stuff that happens. Tell me about those big shows. Uh, how many countries do you think you toured? Most of Europe and Japan. That's it. You know, no, no, no Eastern European stuff because it was still communist a lot yeah. of it at that time. But. And what was the, what's the biggest audience? Outdoor stuff, probably. The, the big outdoor shows um, were around ninety thousand. There were a few like that. Uh -huh. Stadiums, you know. So what's what's that? What's what, what do you remember about that? What's that like? Just that it was so loud when you take the stage. Yeah. It's it the barrage of noise from the crowd is so love, intense. Right? Love. Well, it's it's love. That, that's all loud good. love. That's all good, but your your eardrums take a beating. <laughs> Trust me, it's really yeah. loud. It's so loud you can't even yeah. barely think straight. It's something else. How about the sex, the drugs that goes along with the rock and roll? Sex, drugs, rock and roll. <laughs> Did you hear that, kids? No there's, sex. There's no really drugs, none of that. No rock and no, roll. No, whatever we you do. Don't want this. It's bad. Off limits. It's none of that. No, not. A, it's about the music. I'm talking to you. It's about the music. Okay, so <laughs> back in those days, uh, was, I was a bit conservative. You know, I, Prince was yeah, adamantly yeah. against drug usage. Great. Adamantly, from day one. Yeah. He made that very clear. Um, even alcohol use, he didn't like you drinking. If, 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 if. But. Um, I had a few drinks here and there. Um, I w I'm not a big drinker anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so I I don't do any kind of those stuff, bands that, drugs of any kind. That tour, uh, unless they're prescribed. But touring with with him, like, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why he can prescribe his own because he's the doctor. I can do my own <laughs> prescriptions. That's right. I forgot about you that. You forget all about every this once thing. in a while. I <laughs> and I so, get some things. <laughs> So the years you um, toured them, uh, the, there wasn't that mayhem. He kind of ran a tight ship. He ran a tight ship, but... Um, was it fun? I mean, was he fun? Oh, yeah. He's, Cause, I mean, he's totally so, fun guy. The whole mysterious thing. Hilarious. But funny. He, he, funny, funny guy to be around. A lot of joke. We joked around a lot. We did a lot of fun stuff together. Um, but, of course, then there's that the serious perfectionist side yeah. of him. Game make, Yeah. Game faces. They, the show had to be perfect and, you know, don't make mistakes and be on time and yeah. everything was very run tight ship, you know, on tour. Over the years then you've been doing more of that, you know, you've got your studio here and you, you've also yep. performed, but... Um, mm -hmm. That's correct. And what kind of big projects, what are the biggest kind of fun things you can tell us you did? Uh, there's an artist named David Jordan from uh, London came in. Uh, a few years back that we recorded with. He was signed to Universal. I've worked on some other Universal artists overseas. Um, there, there was this other producer who was uh, working with me over there, a couple actually, the guy in Germany, uh, Mark Mozart, another guy named Chris Vander Hayden, and we, we were doing projects for European people over there primarily. Well, I'll put, I'll put your logo on the screen, mm -hmm. contact info if you want sure. to work with Dr. Fink. Hey, you know, here's a fabulous experience. And, and yeah, uh, and I do a lot of uh, overseas session work. Like, for instance, next week I'll be doing something for some people over in uh, Paris, France. Anywhere in the world you're out there, That's you can right. have Dr. Fink help on your stuff. I'm you know, so blessed to have my friend Dan Jensen. Gotta give a shout out to Dan because sometimes people don't give Dan enough love. We love Introduce you, Dan. Me. We love you, Danny. Dan and Julie and Julie you connected and at the hip. You guys love so your people. Wonderful. Oh, mm, love okay. You. So Dan introduced me to Matt. You're, he's gonna. You're laughing right now. Uh, so Dan introduced me to Matt. We asked if Purple Experience was available, and you guys were f amazing. I mean, it was I'm, still to this day. People are like, they rocked. You guys were great. Tell me how that band got put together. Uh, the Purple Experience, which is a Prince tribute act, and we pay homage to Prince. We love Prince. He is one of the greatest artists on the planet. We <laughs> want him to be. You know, the fans love it that we're doing this because not everybody can see him. And you know, people always tell me how much they love to see me being active and, yeah. and playing this, the music, and that they've never been able to see Prince live, and that it's the next best thing. Marshall and Ace came to me 
and I don't know who came up with the idea. I think it was Ace who said, hey, let's talk to Matt about maybe doing a print show. Or and September 11th with us at Helping Heroes, which is at the Marriott Minneapolis West in St. Louis Park. That's September 11th, honoring 9-11 heroes and street kids from Africa, Port Elizabeth, Africa, Sinatimba Children's Home, uh, through the Karen Cares Foundation, Tunnels, Tunnel to Towers.org. I'll put this all on the screen. So uh, we look forward to having you at that event. Thank you for doing it with us. Would you, you would you do a quick come and see us at Helpful Heroes and I'll chop that and put it into a come to the Helpful Heroes fundraising event featuring me with the Purple Experience at the Marriott Hotel. Minneapolis West. Minneapolis West Marriott Hotel. In your hometown, St. Louis. In Park. your hometown of in my hometown. Taking you home. Taking Dr. Taking, Fink home. Taking Dr. Fink home. Awesome. And thank you, Prince, for being you and giving us a reason to have him. Prince, we love you. Even though we, we love, love Dr. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love Prince. Yeah. And the music we did. I want to keep it alive. I want to introduce it to a whole nother generation. And you had a feeling like you have Prince and the Revolution in your living room. You know it's not Prince, but all uh, all that magic is really there. The illusion is there. It is. But you have the real Dr. Fink. That's right. You do. And thank you for doing this interview. And thank you. And I can't wait to see it September 11th. I'm excited. It's going to be good. I'm excited to be there. You can even hire the Purple Experience. Yes. Thank you for watching You Start TV. You're my soul. You're my shield You're my friend running down my foe in a dangerous field And I thank of you I pray for you wherever you go I just wanted to let you know you're my son, you're my daughter, you're my sister, you're my brother You're my father, you're my mother, you're my warrior father And I dream of you